Hi, I'm Rod Saunders from Joe and Greek, where we discuss theology and apologetics from a charismatic perspective. Well, if you watched my video addressing Dr. Michael Brown's withdrawal from American Gospel 3, then you're familiar with his explanation of why he pulled out of the project. If not, I'd suggest that you watch it real quick. It's only six minutes long. But in today's video, I'm going to be addressing a panel put together by Brandon Kimber, where cessationists offered their thoughts. In this first clip, Justin Peters says that none of them have misrepresented charismatics. And of course, none of us have uh, misrepresented any of the people that we have, we have been talking about. None of us have done that. <laughs> okay, I'm not even going to respond to that, other than to say, check out my Justin Peters playlist, compiled response videos I've compiled over the last five years. It's in the description. In the next clip, Richard Moore says that we're supposed to mark and avoid those who oppose sound doctrine. Paul says it in Romans 16, 17, uh, mark and avoid those who oppose sound doctrine. And um, what would it take for Michael Brown or anybody else for that matter, um, let's say in the NAR, in the uh, extreme charismatic movement, to mark and avoid such teachers? Actually, Paul said, now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. The doctrine he was referring to was justification by faith, which is the theme of Romans. Paul wasn't saying to mark and avoid people who speak in tongues, or who practice grave soaking, or who believe in modern apostles and prophets, or who believe that physical healing is provided in the atonement. He was talking about salvific issues. The Judaizers were causing division by requiring Gentile believers to follow the requirements of the ceremonial law of Moses. The division wasn't being caused by people with a different view on secondary issues. They were teaching a different means to salvation. A similar theme is seen in Galatians. This was the purpose for the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. It was a major issue in the early church. But now, a lot of discernment guys are trying to twist what Paul was saying to mean you should basically mark and avoid everybody who teaches or worships differently from you. That, in fact, is what's divisive, not differing views on issues like eschatology or evangelism. In the next series of clips, you'll hear repeatedly that Dr. Brown says that NAR is a myth. Dr. Brown had an issue with that because um, he for the nations, and of course he doesn't believe the NAR exists. It's a myth. So again, Matthew says he attended uh, Christ for the Nations, lists a, na a, a group of names like Lance Walnau, Cindy Jacobs, Damon Thompson, Dutch Sheets, and briefly mentions that uh, that group could be identified the most as NAR. And that was a huge issue for Brown because, of, again, he, he teaches there and doesn't agree that that movement is really a thing. When Michael Brown says that the NAR doesn't exist, this is an almost 900-page systematic theology for the New Apostolic Reformation so here's a 900-page systematic theology for a movement that supposedly does not exist. Um, I think we all have a copy here. <laughs> ah, there you go. There you go. No, oh, there we go. All right. All right. So I'm not the only one. Good. Michael Brown uh, prides himself on being an acad academician, and um, especially in the languages, and that's his, uh, that's his specialty. But if he just looked a little bit into it, um, there are plethora of academic articles on this subject. Mm -hmm. It is not a construct. It is not, it, 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 he cannot hold that position anymore and be academically honest. There's a direct connection between the original Pentecostals and then the uh, latter rain movement in the late 1940s. Gordon Lindsay was the founder and organizer of that entire movement. And he is the link between the early Pentecostals and people like Todd White today. So for Dr. Michael Brown to say that the New Apostolic Reformation doesn't exist is, is frankly, in my opinion, is 
a worthless thing to, for us to waste our time trying to argue about because it's so obvious that he's wrong. It's so obvious. The evidence is overwhelming. Now let me show you a clip of Dr. Brown from April of 2018 explaining his views on NAR. New Apostolic Reformation was a name that was used by Peter Wagner, who's with the Lord now. Peter Wagner. He was a professor for many years at Fuller Theological Seminary. He had been a missionary before that. And he felt that he was raised up by God as an apostle, that God was raising up apostles all over the world, and that God wanted apostles to be in their proper place in the church and that that was essential for the good of the church. There were many things he taught that I agreed with that I thought were positive and biblical. There were other things that I differed with. He had a particular network of leaders that he oversaw. I was never part of that network of leaders. One reason being, I differed with some of the philosophy. Well, I have believed for decades in what we call fivefold ministry. I have believed for decades in apostles and prophets today based on reading the New Testament, based on seeing the fact that the gift of prophecy was to continue until Jesus returned, based on the fact that others outside the 12 were called apostles, and based on Ephesians 4, which said that Jesus gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers until a certain point. And we haven't reached that point yet. So as I looked at scripture, I thought, well, then they're still here today. When I saw the way Peter Wagner defined it, I agreed with some parts and differed strongly with other parts. All right. There, there is something very specific called the New Apostolic Reformation, which would have a certain number of people that would strongly identify with its principles. Then you make a bigger circle around that, a much bigger circle. That's all the Charismatics Pentecostals who believe in fivefold ministry today, but most of them never heard of NAR. Many of them don't know who Peter Wagner is, and many would disagree with many of the points that would be taught by Peter Wagner. Then you get the biggest circle. That's the Charismatic Pentecostal movement as a whole. From what I can see, the critics of NAR are taking all the abuses and problems in the larger charismatic Pentecostal movement and grouping them together under NAR and then saying that it is somehow networked or has certain common beliefs or whatever. And this is untrue. It is exaggerated and it presents very false pictures. So he acknowledged that NAR, as described by C. Peter Wagner, exists, but it's not what the critics are making it out to be. The myth or conspiracy theory that he has referred to is the NAR hysteria created by the likes of Holly Pivik, that there's this massive movement of hyper-charismatics who believe in an open canon of scripture, who are promoting a theocratic agenda, and who believe in modern apostles and prophets with equal authority to the original 12. Dr. Brown says that he doesn't know anybody who believes that, and I don't either. And for the record, Gordon Lindsay was not the founder of the Healing Revival of 1948. He just published a magazine called The Voice of Healing to report on the revival and promote the various healing ministries taking part in it. The last issue of The Voice of Healing was published in 1957, and Brother Lindsay passed away in 1973. So I don't see how he had any connection to people like Todd White, who nobody heard of until about 10 years ago. In this clip, Stephen Kozar says that the Assemblies of God wrote a position paper against the Latter Rain movement back in 1949. The issue of impartation and having this super power and this super mantle thing, that goes back to the Latter Rain movement. It's no different than what's happening in the New Apostolic Reformation. And the Assemblies of God spoke and wrote against it in their 1949 position paper. And I brought this up in, in more than one of my videos because everyone thinks, oh, these cessationists are all, you know, this, this tiny little cluster. I've even heard somebody refer to us as the cessationist mafia. And well, then I guess the Assemblies of God is part of the cessationist mafia because even they are against this idea of these super, you know, mantle uh, what, what they, they have mantles and they have anointings, they have impartations, and if you go to their meetings, they'll lay hands on you and now you get that impartation. Okay, let's look at the paper that Brother Kozar was talking about. I couldn't find anything on the Assemblies of God website about this, but I think this is the document he's referring to. 
It's from the 23rd General Council of the Assemblies of God in 1949, and it talks about extreme teachings and practices, including an overemphasis on impartation, error that the church is built on the foundation of modern apostles and prophets, confession of sin to man and their approach to deliverance ministry, error of tongues as a means of equipping missionaries to preach, extremism and personal prophecy, other teachings that the Assemblies of God don't like. So you can see here that the Assemblies of God were all for an outpouring of the Spirit, but they wanted to ensure that everything followed Scripture, and they felt that some in the Latter Rain movement weren't doing that. I can tell you, as a guy who attended an Assembly of God church from 1974 to 1980, my pastor, Carl Alcorn, participated in that revival with the blessings of the Assemblies of God. They weren't against the movement, they were against extremism. And so am I. And so is Dr. Brown. So are most charismatics. Of course, you wouldn't know that by listening to the discernment crowd who want to follow John MacArthur's example from the Strange Fire Conference of presenting the extremes as the norm. In this next clip, Chris Roseboro makes a distinction between continuationism and restorationism. It is only people who are academically and historically dishonest and purposely trying to gaslight us that claim that the church has always been continuationist. It's baloney. The, the, uh, the Pentecostals of the early stripes were all restorationists. When you read Frank Bartleman's book on the uh, eyewitness to Azusa Street, he was, not a, he was not a continuationist. He was a restorationist. He believed that God restored the gifts to the church. In fact, he has a whole narrative in, in that book explaining how the Holy Spirit disappeared because he was offended uh, by the fact that the early church be, uh, put in structure and had uh, an org organized church services. According to Bartleman, the, that, that will drive the Holy Spirit away. And it took more than a millennia for the Holy Spirit to return and for th these gifts to be restored. Well, I don't know anybody who makes the claim that the church has always been continuationist. Clearly, throughout most of church history, the gifts were neglected, and the prevailing view was cessationism. But continuationism and restorationism aren't mutually exclusive concepts. A continuationist is a person who believes that the supernatural gifts of the Spirit, listed in 1 Corinthians 12, 8-10, remain in operation until the Lord's return. A restorationist is a person who believes that certain truths or practices seen in the early church were lost and need to be restored. It seems to me that Chris is trying to redefine restorationism to support his argument. Restorationism isn't the belief that we need to restore something that God ended. It's the belief that we need to restore something that God brought about but was lost to the church either by ignorance, unbelief, or corruption. In the next clip, Richard Moore claimed that Dan Farrelly of Bethel said that Luther and Calvin were apostles, but they didn't call themselves apostles because they didn't know the word for apostles. The Rediscover Bethel podcast, Dan Farrelly, the pastor of Bethel, said that um, the, uh, the reformers, Luther, uh, Calvin, and then he named others like Spurgeon and even then Wesley a little bit later in that whole pie. He said they were all apostles and they just did not know that they could call themselves apostles. They didn't know the word to use as if Luther, who translated the Bible in six months in Wartburg here in Germany, did not know the word apostolos. Can you imagine that, Chris? Um, no. <laughs> yeah. So... No, they, re they, they, they barter in revisionism history, so they have to revise history to insert apostles all throughout and sprinkle it throughout. Although all those reformers would have rejected the term out of hand. I think Richard Moore is engaging in a bit of straw manning here. Now, I'm not sure, but I think this is the clip that he was referring to. Apostles were the most common title given to a spiritual leader in that day, at least named. 
Yeah. Along with profits. And then, so we're not saying this is the only way to do no, church no, government, no, no. or if not. you don't do it this way, you're you're out of the will of God, or you've misunderstood any of that sort of thing. It's just that the case we're making the case like, no, there there are actually apostles are necessary for the church to be its amazing self. Yeah. I, I would say that we've had apostles for a long time. We just didn't have the label for them. So yeah. when I when I look at Luther or Calvin, they're probably just turning over in their graves with that. But to the, <laughs> <laughs> these are guys who start. Careful, uh, uh, yeah, they interpret great scripture. Great cloud of witnesses <laughs> watching us, maybe right now or something. So they uh, they interpret scripture. They create yeah. whole movements. They yeah. they, ha they have interaction with other large uh, mm -hmm. leaders of other movements, yeah. saying, "Hey, I'm concerned about this. I wonder about this." And so, you look through. There's been apostles all through church history, but we just didn't have a label for them. And so we've kind of it's uh, you know every denomination, almost every denomination has an apostle, an apostolic person. Put it that way. Even yeah, if they I didn't think call that's easier that, to swallow. Yeah an apostolic type person leading it or initiating that, yes. that movement. And so, you know, you look at A.B. Simpson with the CMA or Amy Simple McPherson or even like I mentioned, Calvin or Lutheran. These yeah. guys are starting whole movements, raising up leadership, giving interpretation of scripture. Uh, they might not, uh, they've suffered for it. Like Paul talks about the marks yeah. of an apostle. Um, um, maybe not moving in signs and wonders, all of them, but Paul talked about moving in signs and wonders being yeah. one of the marks of the apostles. Yes, he did. So what Dan was actually saying was not that Luther and Calvin didn't know the word apostle, but that the church didn't know what to call them because it stopped using the word apostle. Whether or not Luther and Calvin should be described as apostles is up for debate, but there's no question that the church stopped referring to people as apostles in the Reformation era due to its cessationist leanings and its opposition to the Catholic Church's claim of apostolic succession. Their disdain for the Catholic Church left them with an aversion to any use of the word apostle in the modern church. So naturally, they avoided it. In this clip, Chris Roseboro says that Jimmy Evans is the apostle over Robert Morris's Gateway Church. It's well documented that Gateway Church has an apostolic leadership. This is just well, e easy to get at. I mean, just go to their website. It talks about these things, you know, and I don't understand, I, it, it, except for Dr. Brown is constantly running interference. And he, it, what's weird is, is that, you know, I spend my weekdays researching, 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 listening to people, going back and re-listening to what I've just listened to, taking notes then on the third try and trying to work this all out and how how to put this together. I don't see Michael Brown putting ev any effort at all into researching to see if, if the claims that you're making can somehow hold water because it doesn't take more than five minutes to recognize that, wait a second, uh, Gateway Church, Jimmy Evans is the apostle of, uh, uh, of uh, Robert Morris. Well, first of all, Dr. Brown has an international ministry to run, an itinerant speaking schedule, and a ministry school to oversee, in addition to his daily broadcast. Chris Roseboro, on the other hand, pastors a church of about 100 people in Pig's Butt, Minnesota, which leaves him plenty of time to devote to his blog and his YouTube channel and looking for people to ridicule, criticize, or condemn. And secondly, Jimmy Evans is considered the senior pastor or apostolic senior pastor at Gateway because he helped plant the church. If you go to the history page of Gateway's website, it tells you that Robert Morris approached the leadership of Trinity Fellowship in Amarillo, Texas, seeking guidance on starting a new church in the Dallas area. At the time, Jimmy Evans was the pastor at Trinity, and he prayed for and blessed Robert Morris to start the new church. What the website doesn't tell you is that Trinity gave them a lot of money. I'm guessing tens of thousands of dollars in startup money. And that Jimmy Evans filled in as the pastor when Robert Morris was recovering from an illness a few years ago. He's not just their apostolic elder in title. He's been there for them from day one. They have a great deal of history and a relationship established. Jimmy Evans pastored Trinity for over 30 years and is considered their senior elder, while Jimmy Witcher has been the senior pastor for 10 years or so. So Jimmy Evans didn't just walk into Gateway one day and say, I'm your apostle. He's been a father figure to pastors Robert Morris and Jimmy Witcher for decades. He doesn't claim to have equal authority to the original 12 apostles. 
He doesn't presume to write new scripture as if the canon of scripture is open, and he doesn't dictate everything that goes on either at Gateway or at Trinity. He's there if they need him, but he has his own ministry to run, including a daily broadcast, writing, and itinerant speaking. In this final clip, Richard Moore says that the Charismatics in American Gospel 3 have a backwards soteriology. Uh, Galloway said, uh, the joy of my salvation, the re that kind of repentance doesn't make me think of the joy of my salvation. He's got it backwards. First thing, the joy of someone's salvation only comes after one has repented and put their faith in Jesus Christ. You're not mm -hmm. saved until you've done that. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, gentlemen. <laughs> um, repentance uh, comes um, uh, and, and, and you're saved. Uh, you're not saved before that. So you can't have the joy of your salvation unless you've repented. Um, and uh, so it's a backwards, let's say a backwards uh, uh, soteriology. Now, I'm not sure, but I think Richard is a Calvinist. On his website, he said, I believe in the total depravity of man and his inability of bringing himself out of that state apart from the intervening grace of God. That sounds like Calvinism to me. And in Calvinism, they believe that you're regenerated before you believe in Jesus, because you can't have saving faith until you're regenerated. So it just strikes me as odd that a Calvinist would accuse others of having a backwards soteriology. Shout out to Jesse Westwood, who was on the panel, but didn't say anything that I felt I needed to respond to. As usual, I'll leave you some links in the description if you want to follow up on what I've covered in this video. Thanks for watching, and be blessed.